Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture number two, the course Rome, Where Are We? So it is uh, Wednesday on November 30th. It's uh, around about the middle of the day on the West Coast here. So this is Spengler. We got to cram the Spengler into the 30 minutes. I will begin with the Spengler elevator pitch, and then we'll, we'll go into this. Um, like any good poet, like any good philosopher, uh, you don't just stop. I've gone over this many times. Um, we're not gonna do it justice with one pass. You don't just stop reading it after a certain number of times, like any good poet, any good philosopher. Because of the, every time you see it again, because of the changes in you, the text reveals new things when you go over it again. We're going to have plenty to discuss during the, uh, the seminar session. This is a preview. So uh, some things to keep in mind, not only his main idea, how we understand the analogy, also how we understand prime symbol going forward. This is very important because um, as the repression, we'll see here, as a repression of the emergent prime symbol was the, meant the, uh, the repeated inflammation of revolt in Rome going forward. It was repressing the prime symbol of, of the East. Um, so it will be in one way or another, potentially, uh, with our culture going forward. If, if we're understanding what kind of prime symbol might be emerging, which Spengler told us was Russia, and well, look what's happening. The more we understand this, the better uh, <laughs> we, we can have things play out for ourselves in the world. And that's really the whole point. So the elevator pitch of, of Spengler, really, the brutal summary. So it's the idea of, of, of rise and fall, that civilizations, instead of uh, looking at the world in any number of ways of historiography, of early, medieval, modern, of uh, just world cultures, whatever, uh, European history, Asian history, he says, okay, look, I wonder if there's a shape to history. If there, if there is a rise and fall of culture and civilizations, what is that like? So at the, at the early start of it, he said these last roughly a, roughly a thousand years, they emerge in various areas. You have a rise, which he calls Kultur, which I think of as a gathering of energy, and then a disperse uh, civilization, civilization, uh, which is the dispersal of this energy, you can think of as the decline. And sometimes these cultures end up uh, declining and just staying that way for a very, very long time, like China or India, or sometimes they just kind of go poof uh, and, and collapse. Uh, sometimes, like in the, for the Roman Empire, they kind of fossilize for a while and then they bust up. So right now, we're kind of at the tail end of some, um, some, some culmination, the culture. But here we go. I did want to give a little bit of context of uh, what Spengler was in the middle of. I think that's important. So he was in the middle of the pressure cooker of World War I. He thought about all of this stuff in 1911. He, he writes about that in our reading for today, the first two chapters of Decline of the West, Untergang des Abendlandes. Uh, he was formulating his ideas in, in 1911. He discusses this at the end of chapter one. Um, he says that he saw the Great War coming, um, and he worked this out. And uh, World War I uh, may not have been as I said, it was a pressure cooker. It may not have been the cause or start of modernistic transformations, but as with much in politics, technology, and culture, intensifying conflict helped to accelerate these changes. This is some of the context for what Spengler was, was living through. So as the war in Germany, as the war came to a close, a sense of time had sped up, not just on battlefields, but on the home fronts as well. After a run of more than 450 years, the Romanov dynasty was sunk in carbolic acid. Vienna was suddenly the capital of Austria and Austria only post-war. The Kaiser simply retired to the seaside Netherlands. The urges to democratic and social reform in Germany that had been pressing for more than half a century in parliament under strict imperial control were suddenly loosed. In rapid phases, spanning mere weeks and months, Germany gained stunning concessions on signing a peace treaty with the newly born and surrendering Soviet Union in early 1918. 
On September 27th, during the Muzargana Festive, the Western Allies' attrition strategy paid off as breakthrough was finally achieved against Germany on the Western Front. The war was finished strategically, but not factually. The German surrender would be eventually attained with no enemy forces on German soil. On November 3rd, the German Navy's Baltic fleet mutinied at the Kiel docks. Meanwhile, in Berlin, moderate socialist ministers in the Reichstag stepped up in government leadership as the Kaiser had stayed in relative seclusion. He abdicated on request and poof, instant democracy. The mutinous sailors from the Kiel docks marched on to Berlin. The moderate socialists feared revolution so much that they caused one. And the old constitution was no longer in effect in the midst of a power vacuum. Radical socialists, communists, seized control in the capital and major cities for all practical purposes. The GSSR was declared, but would not last long. Effective November 11th, at 11.11 a.m., the conservative vice-chancellor of Germany had signed an armistice on behalf of that country with the Allies, ending hostilities. The army had retreated from French and Belgian territory, while the reactionary elements, still loyal to an emperor who no longer ruled them within that army's leadership, all but declared civil war on the rebellious navy and their radical worker party allies, idealistic hope, fervently poured into the new democratic constitution that was being drafted in Weimar, soon to be home of the Bauhaus Art and Architecture School, while the Reds and reactionaries were still killing each other in the streets all across Germany. This whole thing, from the naval revolt through four governments and the end of the Great War to the onset of civil war and finally to a new civil order, all took place in the course of just nine months two weeks and four days. This summary of which you have heard just now even faster. So if anyone wants to go deep into the context um, with all that and outlook to the roots of uh, modern architecture, you'll, you'll find that in uh, episode 11 of my old podcast, uh, Bauhaus Part Dieu, uh, Crucible of Isms. So that's a, a little vignette of what Spengler was dealing with and partly why he was so uh, motivated uh, to get this out that people could could see, because because obviously this is this is quite uh, quite a thing. There's a, a, a good a uh, good Greek word apokalypsos. Uh, uh, that's the the grand revelation, often happening at times of of destruction. So um, that's the backdrop by which he was saying, "Hey, everybody, pay attention." Let's look at how cultures evolve so that we can do this uh, the right way, ideally. Right now, okay. So, we're less than 10 minutes in, which means we have about 20 minutes to get through this, this chapter. I'm gonna hit some highlights, and then we can go, we're gonna go over this on, uh, in depth. This could be a whole course on its own. John has done fantastic detailed work on this with his many part um, summation and introduction to Spengler on his channel, which, which I highly recommend. So, he's starting off here. He says that this is a, a first attempt at all of this, and it is. It's all over the place. He's, he's almost writing this as if he's just having a large journal and he and, and it's like you're discovering this with him that's engaging it's absorbing but it does make it confusing for example we'll see that uh, certain terms that he would help him to define he just kind of unleashes on you like faustian magian so we're we're, we're going to go through that here um he does mention some things about about hegel uh which we'll get to here, he, and he says at the, at the beginning, life is only fulfilled in death. That brings, it sounds a little dark, but that, it brings to mind a, a, a quote from Hegel, one of his most famous quotes, that the owl of, when philosophy paints, it's, this is very important, when philosophy paints, it's gray in gray. We know that an era of the world has come to a close, and the owl of Minerva spreads her wings only at the onset of dusk. So it's, um, this guy is such an expressionist too. We're going to, we're going to see that. Um, 
life itself is only fulfilled in death. This, he makes a distinction between the mathematics of Newton, the mathematics of physics, which is in, evol looks at things that are static, and then says history cannot be like this. However much he wants to make history scientific, it has to be an idea of, of looking at uh, the shape of things changing. We can talk about being and becoming. We'll get into this in the discussion. It's a very platonic distinction, something from the Timaeus and the Critias, um, which he alludes to being and becoming quite often here. The idea of, of the form, the understandable form of something, and then there's the actualization of this form. That's being. Being is the form. Becoming is the way that it is expressed in the world. So his science is the science of becoming, a science of understanding how history moves along. So, he also mentions Leibniz. I was, I was, uh, it's interesting, I was, I was kind of, I had forgotten that he had done that. Um, he says that Goethe, who influenced him so heavily, was a disciple of Leibniz in his whole mode of thought. So that's, that's a very big deal. We're working in Leibniz in, into this course. Um, in, in this chapter, he talks about he believes that Leibniz was the greatest intellect of, uh, of the modern West. I think that might be true. So, going past some of the introduction, here we are. He starts with um, being and becoming, and the, he's establishing a difference between analysis and analogy. Everybody uses analogy right or wrong. He says a lot of the historians, a good deal of this, um, I, kind of especially at the end of the first chapter, has to deal with him dismantling what he thinks are the old worn out ideas of historiography. That he's, he's arguing against people who aren't in the room. Uh, and that's some of the more wordy bits of this. But the, 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 summarize, the summary of it is that um, we're always making these analogies. And he, he wants to make it very rigorously. So. There's the idea that he wants to distinguish form from substance. Uh, he is talking about the, the world as history uh, versus the world as nature. And the, he, he brings up ideas that would be further examined by the postmodernists. He, he even he, he talks about this uh, several ways the idea of qualifying the the idea being skeptical of the idea of mathematics as not something that is uh, eternal that you discover but something that is qualified that's defined by a dialogue of perception between you and the world and then he looks at how mathematics and this is in chapter two he looks at how mathematics then um, when you, when you look at how mathematics defines space. How mathematics defines a, how, how you understand physical extension, then informs art, informs culture. And there are certain what you could call epistemic boundaries where the way that mathematics is understood changes. This is core to the idea of prime symbol, which we're going to be getting to here. He's also part of what makes this um, difficult is that he's um, extremely erudite. Um, he's speaking, he's writing and speaking to an audience that had a tremendous, tremendous education. He'd be making references. He'll be referencing battles. There's one point where he mentions a battle in the, the French, from the French Revolution. So, um, without saying what it is. So the, the internet, um, try not to look up stuff constantly with him, but if you want to look something up just so you know what the heck he's talking about, that often helps to contextualize because he was writing, he was writing for an audience that would have known all this stuff. Or at least most of it. They would have liked to have think they would have known, even if they didn't know it. So... Moving along here, he talks about history as in the, uh, is, is in the past. We have the, the, the classical historians. He talks about the way different cultures have approached senses of history. The classical didn't really do it. They didn't have much of a sense of memory. He's feeling out here. He's starting off um, talking about historiography, 
which is how, how you approach and categorize, how you understand history itself, and saying that the classical, uh, the, the ancient authors of the ancient Mediterranean didn't really do history like we, say, we see it now. It's very popular to say this now. It was maybe a little bit more controversial uh, back then. Uh, but they, like Thucydides, I have a note here, that Thucydides was basically a journalist. Uh, and uh, Herodotus, the other historian, Mediterranean historian before him, was... Uh, don't want to say gossip monger because he was better than that, but he, he was a storyteller. He was a storyteller, kind of an entertainer, and then it ended up being an entertainment about the past. Uh, they didn't have the kind of uh, rigorous examination and the historical feeling that we do. And by contrast, the Egyptians and the Babylonians, to a certain extent, the Chinese had a sense of, um, but, but especially the Egyptians and the Babylonians had the sense of precision a precise history which was kept their culture in a certain shape and just went way 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 back he was even aware i was very impressed to to notice that he was even aware of stuff um uh like the old uh, the old king's lists that go back before the first dynasty so he was he was aware of that even back then uh so the He says that in Plato we fail to observe any conscious evolution of doctrine. He's trying to emphasize how the classics didn't evolve. I think they did, but uh, we, we can discuss that. Um, and here, this is, this is another important link to postmodernism. He says that a feeling, if you want to follow along, this is on page 15 for context, a feeling for form, however definite, is not the same as the form itself. I think this is a more, there are several moments where this surfaces. This is a more rigorous presentation of what becomes the postmodern view. The, the valuable things about postmodernism are the sense of skepticism, which he treats here, an emerging skepticism. Uh, and also the that that the philosophy he says that the philosophy that's coming um, in the West is not going to be a philosophy of anything except skepticism, which was absolutely true. That's what postmodernism uh, at heart was. And instead of it being this kind of rootless thing that just says anything goes and there is no truth, it's just my power and my opinion that's kind of useless and even abusive. Uh, but if you realize that there, the, the skepticism is valuable, getting rid of the universals, where universals are inappropriate, is very valuable. And the idea of, as he says, feeling for form, however definite, is not the same as form itself. This is a big deal. This is, this is the idea of uh, that, that, that Derrida would later express this similar idea, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, the idea of the différend, the idea of the gap between the symbol and the thing. So this is, this is important that he's acknowledging this in 1917. He was ahead of the curve in many ways. So he's geometrizing uh, historiography. That's the other thing to, to point on about this, is that uh, he's saying, um, and this is further on on page 16, um, that we're badly in need of the little of that skepticism again the skepticism from Galileo onward that has regulated and deepened our inborn ideas of nature so he's setting up a science of uh, history he's referring to Galileo to talk about a science of history but it, it, Galileo was a great geometer he was speaking as that uh, that mathematics were the language of nature thinking of geometry so this is uh, in a sense, a, uh, a geometry of uh, qualities that you're seeing, you're seeing how things, um, I believe, uh, I'm making too many references here, uh, but, but he, he himself makes the springtime, summertime references to the cultures uh, in this, the idea that when a culture is born, it is like the springtime, or maybe it's born in winter, and then it goes through a springtime, a summertime, and a fall period. Uh, and I believe that, um, John knows more about Toynbee than I do, but I think Toynbee expressed this this further, the idea of the seasonal division. I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, I like keeping it simple and dividing it into culture, 
and civilization, the rising of energy and the dispersal of energy, uh, and then to kind of color that, not to overcomplicate it with the seasons and say, oh, this is this season, this is that season, but to to color the shape of the rise and fall by by thinking about like what is your what is your historical weather that that's that's very important that's also very important to our decisions because you know obviously you're not going to you know you're, you're not going to plant tomatoes in october um it's not going to work uh you know so you don't you're not going to have uh grand innovative um philosophy um springtime philosophy um you know, in the 20th century. He also said you're not going to have grand um, grand music that is Western, grand painting that is Western. That was, you can argue about that, but I think that that's, that that's mostly, that's mostly true. There was a sense of creative exhaustion. The great art that did come was about or grappling with that sense of exhaustion. So he says that the idea of modern, the word modern, had become absolutely meaningless. It's even more meaningless now. And I think this is a, a very good point. Um, <laughs> so we got to start using a different word, or at least, you know, not rely on the word modern so much. So he starts talking about morphogenesis. This is very, very important um, that... He says, we know it to be true of every organism that the rhythm, the form, and duration of its life and all its expression details of life are determined by the properties of the species. This is a connection back to the ideas of Goethe as when he was walking through Italy, he was noticing how the environment is shaping and affecting a plant. The environment shapes and affects the organism. The historical environment shapes and affects the civilization and gives it definite characteristics which we can see over time. So this is, this is morphogenesis, the idea of creation of shape. All right, and I'm trying to pace myself. I only have nine minutes on this. So, let's move to some very important things. He talks about the difference between culture and civilization. As I said, this is the, the qualitative analysis. You're not looking at cause and effect he, he thinks that too much of the history in the past was obsessed with the idea of cause and effect. And so here he's talking about the idea of, of destiny. And although he never mentions it, there was a German histo art historian called Alois Riegel. Um, I did a search on this. I don't think he mentions it or talks about it, but the idea of, of Kunstwollen, the idea of a, a destiny of art, that the late Roman art was, was changing into something else. I think he was tapping on the very, very similar roots to, to Spengler. And the, the Romans, he says, were a successor to the Greeks. And the United States ends up being a uh, successor to, uh, to Europe. He talks about the uh, Germanic, the, it was the Latin, but this is page 36. It was not the Latin, but the Germanic peoples of the Western America who developed out of the steam engine a big industry that transformed the face of the land, the relation of these phenomena to Stoicism and to, uh, to Stoicism and to socialism is unmistakable. And he's talking about the, the broad sense of uh, Anglo-Saxon culture, the idea of German-speaking people and English-speaking people kind of having a cultural connection, and then America also having a cultural connection to this being analogous, say, to the France and Italy, and more of the prominent Renaissance countries being more like Greece, having their cultural prominence earlier. And so you'll see a shift, this idea between Kultur and Civilization, he talks about how that can be expressed in the idea of the springtime cities. Uh, a place like in the Mediterranean frame, a place like Athens, a place like Sparta, a place like Corinth. Um, and then in our timeline, in the Western timeline, what he calls the Faustian, you would have a place like uh, Florence, Pisa, Genoa, um, and to a certain extent, you know, Marseille or Provence. And then as the, as it goes from kind of this, uh, small 
springtime um, instinctual era where it's rooted to the land, then it goes to this large imperial idea where you have a capital city. And this is an important theme that's part of this shift. You go from the self-sustaining city, like Florence was, to a large capital of an empire that instead of producing what it needs and being self-sufficient, it draws resources from hinterlands around it. And of course, the logic of this, this is part of the life cycle. That doesn't last forever. It's not sustainable. It can't be sustainable. So you have a, an empire has to expand or collapse or fossilize. It either finds an equilibrium, um, which you could say to a certain degree India did. He argues that India was the, the place that kind of stabilized and stayed the same for a long time. He also said very interestingly that their sense of history was very different, that they, they didn't have exactly a memory of the past. I would want to quibble with that and qualify it a little bit because there are some things in the Indian memory that are absolutely, absolutely ancient, like the Brahmin chants that scientists have found out are related to the very earliest uh, types of human language. But I suppose that's disconnected from a sense of history. It's been preserved through history so long that all the shapes of history are kind of collapsed around it. And they're preserving something that's, as we've as we can best guess, is about 40,000 years old, which is amazingly impressive. But it, does, it, it doesn't, in order for it to preserve, be preserved that, that long, maybe, um, it has to shake off the encumbrances of, of historical, of focused historical association. I thought it was very interesting that he noted that the Mahabharata and the Ramayana were not books with specific authors. They were, um, he thought, oh, it was so messy that anyone could insert anything they wanted into it. And I thought to myself, well, this sounds a lot like Wikipedia, that we're, we're more accustomed to this, this idea of multiple authorship. That's another sign that what we're living through is, is a time of a grand transition like this. So he sets up in the first chapter about the sense of history and of how um, you can work by analogy and the idea of the destiny problem instead of the, the causality. Destiny instead of causality, the idea that if we can make the plant analogy, the idea that uh, maybe the sun, when the, the sun, air, and rain are causing a plant to grow. But if you want to find out when a plant has seeds, when you find out when the flower falls, when you find out when the, the tree has apples, looking at causality, looking at what causes the apples is going to tell you, is going to be less useful than understanding the destiny of the tree, than understanding that the apples turn red in the fall. And, and, you, and you don't want to eat them when they're sour. And that the idea that you're going to be, you know, you're planting, planting your tomatoes in the, in the spring, in the springtime. And, you know, uh, so this is, uh, you can't be obsessed with making history like physics. That was one of the major points of the first chapter, because it actually making it like physics with causality, thinking what caused this in history. That's less important than the shape of what happens. And that's really an important breakthrough. So the second chapter, and this is very important, is the idea of the meaning of numbers. Now he gets off into uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of technical things that we're not necessarily going to um, get into, lost in the weeds on. But it's important to know here that, for example, he says, higher history intimately related to life and becoming is the actualizing of possible culture. This is very important because just, just as you have um, the shape of history kind of being the abstraction or the aggregate of everybody's decisions all, all through history, and it, it happens in much the same way, and this is my own analogy I'm making here, just as, say, the... Um, a company's stock or the stock market, a market index pattern, that's the, the history of that, the path that it takes, is an actualizing of market sentiment expressed in purchases. That's a kind of history. Again, number. He relies on number because you can see the connection between quantity and quality very, very clearly when you're dealing with numbers.
he challenges the idea that numbers are universal. Um, he challenges the idea that uh, there is not and cannot be number as such. Numbers are not a definite thing. And this seems weird to us. We're taught that it's the, it's the highest, it's the most empirical of all sciences. Well, it's not empirical. How did that, uh, that Einstein quote go? As the laws of mathematics pertain to reality, they are not certain. And as the laws of mathematics are certain, they do not pertain to reality. Uh, he said that, I believe, uh, that was in a lecture in the 20s. It was after Spengler. Um, and when Einstein was saying that, uh, that was after the publication of something he would have known well called the Principia Mathematica, published by, uh, you know, uh, Whitehead and Russell can't remember their first names. Um, <laughs> uh, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead, I believe their names are. So they, they thought, they were writing that book because they thought, they named it after Newton's Principia Mathematica, they thought that they were going to absolutely prove how numbers work. They, would, they wanted to prove that numbers were a thing. They were quite possibly the greatest mathematicians of their age, of an age of great mathematicians, and they found out they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. The book Gödel Escher Bach uh, deals with the implications of this. Um, it's it's a great book, by the way. Um, so, and he's saying kind of the cartoonish postmodernist response to this is to be saying, "Oh, that's all BS. All that stuff. Oh, you can't. Oh, there is no such thing as truth. No, 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 no. It's not that there is no such thing as truth. Is that is that you qualify truth. And furthermore." It's not something to be disheartened of that we qualify or subjectivize mathematics a little bit. No, it reveals. It reveals to us a periodization of how mathematics works, about how we understand it. So we're going to be talking about all of that. The I'm tempted to go on for, say, three more hours at least on this. But here he goes at the end of this chapter, he starts talking about, he kind of ambushes you with the terms Magian, with the terms Faustian, um, which we're going to define the way he understands the different cultures. We'll be discussing this more when we have proper time in class. And of course, send me your questions. And I suppose we'll leave it with this thought. Key to the idea of prime symbol the idea of that there's a way of understanding. The classical prime symbol was body, was the column. The, the Faustian prime symbol in the era that we live in is the idea of infinite space. And it informs the arts, it informs the philosophy, it informs the mathematics. And the key to prime symbol is extension. And he said that extension meant for classical mankind body and for us space. And it is as a function of space that to us things appear. And looking backward from this standpoint, we may perhaps see into the deepest concept of classical metaphysics. And I would say that looking forward, we can see with this, this is something to think about. What is our, is, is there a prime symbol that's emerging now? I think there is. I think our sense of prime symbol is being challenged. What else would postmodernist philosophy be? What else would all this disenchantment be? And at root that's happening because the sense of the experts, there are new challenges that aren't being met. But what do we have? We have someone like Nikola Tesla. We have someone talking about resonance, talking about waveform. We have all of these uh, from the from high on Olympus with him and in innovation down to people taking tours to South America with Brian Forster. And, and they have this kind of new age religious feeling. They say, oh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. That's another thing, the second religiousness that we'll need to get into. He talks about this here, about the resurgence of religion. When there's an instinctive resurgence of religion, what are these people doing? They're standing in front of, of stones and going, and they're singing at stones, the idea of resonance. And if we think about, this hit my mind very clearly, reading this again, uh, extension, the key is ex how we understand extension in a world where we have, in a world with networks, uh, the idea of infinite space and linearity somewhat breaks down. Um, with resonance and entrainment, 
uh, networks and no network and node dynamics are no longer the idea of infinite space and they wrap in within each other and they tend to work with with the ideas of amplification of, of cancellation we talk about cancellation all the time these days don't we that's a waveform cancellation is a waveform idea you get two waves uh with opposite uh phasing they cancel each other out um people will say oh yeah that really resonates with me man and that used to be a way out weird thing to say it's less weird now maybe um you know people meditate with singing bowls so but then we'll have to think about what this means i think there are lots of great things to talk about i've already gone over the 30 minutes i'm just trying to think if there's anything else I want to cover because there's always a bunch of stuff. The idea of the pseudomorphosis. Ah, yes, we'll end with this. And this is towards the end. Towards the end of the second chapter, he starts talking about, and I'll give you a shortcut to it. It's on page 72. So there's a pseudomorphosis. Um, he talks about the Arabian culture, which he didn't use that word here, but that's what this is. It means false shaping. It means a crystal growing into the space of a different crystal and taking the shape of the old crystal, but being a new thing. So, and this is what happens with cultures. A new culture grows in the shape of the old. Uh, the Western culture built churches in the Romanesque style before it hit its stride with Gothic. Things like that. So the Arabian culture, which under the cover of the classical civilization had been germinating in the East since Augustus. The Arabian culture germinating since Augustus. Think about that. Came wholly, and there was war because of that. Multiple ones. Germinating in the East since Augustus came wholly out of the region between Armenia and Southern Arabia, Alexandria and Tessaphon. Alexandria's in Egypt, Tessaphon's in Iraq. We have to consider as expressions of this new soul almost the whole late classical art of the empire. The young ardent religions of the East, Mandianism, Manichaeanism, and Christianity. Uh, and then you add to that when it becomes confident, uh, you add Islam. Uh, so right now, do we have pseudomorphosis? I think we do. We have a sense of uh, pushing against a, a new religion. We have an empire, which is still telling itself it's a republic. And there we are. The analogies continue. Thank you for your indulgence on this lasting more than, than, than 30 minutes. It's difficult to condense it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, write down your questions or remember your questions. There's a lot to dispute here. It's going to be very enjoyable. I look forward to it. So talk to everyone here this coming Saturday. Thank you.